I'm Catherine, um, and I'd like to begin by vibrationally exchanging some gratitude as yet further creative debt to the culture. Um, thank you, David, Ted, Mark, Eldridge, and Rebecca. Um, this conference is really one of the highlights of my year, so I'd like to begin with your words, not my own. In summoning us this weekend, you appeal to the, quote, impossible, imaginary, and or unintelligible, close quote. Yet the ideas that I intend to outline this morning will hinge on a notion that the impossible and imaginary is more and more incompatible with the unintelligible. I'll ask whether, again, borrowing your excellent words, the quote, possibly impossible and likely unlikely, close quote, is by now too like the, quote, known unknowns uh, prophesied by Donald Rumsfeld, and so all too vulnerable to militaristic and capitalist co-optation and the general baseness of exchange. Arguably, quivering indeterminacy is all the more valuable to today's growing arsenal of speculative slash predictive slash database slash probabilistic slash et cetera exchange practices. And by this, I mean not only financial practices, but also social ones. And I want to kind of think about this idea of, uh, we talked yesterday about community and collectivity, so that's something that I'm also thinking about. Um, I worry that as a result of probabilities marketplace hegemony on both fronts, it is becoming today impossible to be anything other than possibly. I'll argue <laughs> that this has interesting consequences on an ontological level for human non-human distinctions and on a pragmatic one for politics. So I know I'm down for TBA, but there is a title. My paper today is called Personalities Without People some tuning spec repeat offenders may recall a talk I gave last year in the immediate wake of the US presidential election. That talk concerned the then barely emergent phenomenon of fake news and what a year it's been. Here I'll be picking up and picking at a stray thread that I found and ignored in the course of my research last year, um, that being psychometrics. Secondarily, by approaching data and network ecologies through object-oriented feminism, lovingly known as OOF, I'll try to expose what I see as a feminist quandary within the logics of psychometrics and predictive data practices in general. So, in the days to days following the US presidential election, I was reading obsessively about malignant clickbait and fake news on Facebook when I came across a New York Times article by Mackenzie Funk titled, The Secret Agenda of a Facebook Quiz. And so I stumbled into the orbit of psychometrics and a company named Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica has surfaced in mainstream news of late, so many of you have probably heard of this data firm hired by the Trump campaign. But in summary, just a couple high notes. The House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Special Counsel uh, Robert Mueller's Russia probe, and now the Senate <laughs> Judiciary Committee are all investigating Cambridge Analytica. Most recently, the firm made headlines on October, 20, uh, yeah, October 25th when news broke that CEO Alexander Nix had reached out to Julian Assange seeking to team up with WikiLeaks to help release Hillary Clinton's famous missing emails. Cambridge Analytica is a US-based big data firm that, you, quote, uses data to change audience behaviors, and it specializes in political campaigns, drawing in part on the PSYOPs defense contracting work of its shadowy British parent company, SCL Group. Mostly, <coughs> Cambridge works in support of right-wing political campaigns, primarily in the US and Britain, although none other than Hillary Clinton noted that September's overturned Kenyan election was also a Cambridge project. Before the Trump campaign, the firm worked on Republican campaigns for Ted Cruz and Ben Carson, as well as the pro-Brexit um, Leave.eu campaign, <laughs> among others, and they are also under investigation in the UK. So there's plenty more to say, um, particularly about the, campaign, uh, the company's uh, funders and board members, 
but rather than indulge my inner conspiracy theorist and in the interest of time, I'll refer you to Carol Cadwallader's remarkable series of articles on the company in The Guardian, which I highly recommend. But for now, just a word of caution. It is a fact that the Trump campaign hired Cambridge Analytica and that Cambridge sent three staff uh, members to San Antonio, where they worked with Brad Perscal, the Trump campaign's uh, digital director. Cambridge publicly identifies itself with psychometrics or interchangeably psychographics and boasts having 5,000 data points for each of 230 million Americans. Nevertheless, Pascal, who was interviewed by the House Intelligence Committee on the 24th, has repeatedly insisted that in their work for the Trump campaign, Cambridge was doing things other than psychometrics and was using data other than their own, specifically data obtained totally above board from the RNC. So my skepticism is beside the point. <coughs> what interests me is less whether psychometrics is unsavory or has been applied toward politically disagreeable ends or even whether or not it works, um, and more what it suggests about identity and political subjecthood right now. So what is psychometrics and what is Cambridge Analytica up to? According to Funk in the Times article, Cambridge Analytica has been using Facebook as a tool to build psychological profiles that represent some 230 million adult Americans by seeding the personality network with personality quizzes. We've all seen them. These quizzes ask innocuous questions like, do you have a vivid imagination? Do you have a sharp tongue? Do you often feel blue? Do you get your chores done right away? My favorite, do you like art? <laughs> the quizzes are a key ingredient of Cambridge Analytica's special sauce, which combines personality trait-based psychological profiling, micro-targeted advertising techniques, political messaging, and of course, big data. When Facebook quizzes ask us if we feel blue or promptly do our chores, they are measuring our psychological traits through a metric known as the five-factor model, which assesses the quote-unquote big five personality traits known by the acronym OCEAN, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Developed in the 1980s, the big five metric indicates an individual's psychological character, priorities, and importantly, future behavior, and is now the psychometric gold standard. As an aside, psychological typologies are far older and date back to none other than Sir Francis Dalton, the father of eugenics. But psychometrics <laughs> caught my attention. Just, just going to leave that there. Okay. My psychometrics caught my attention for other reasons having to do with oof. As it happens, the psychometric personality attributes are a near-perfect example of secondary qualities, attributes of objects that in object-oriented theories, like object-oriented feminism, have become objects on their own and um, in their own right. So gender, race, um, class, and so on are all attributes that once formed the basis of subject-oriented identity politics. But, um, and, and as well, at the basis of demographics. But by, um, they did this by referring back to the human subject. And these now, these secondary qual uh, qualities of people objects are becoming detachable and remixable independent objects. And the same goes for qualities like personality types. They could be arranged in a formation that looks like or centers on a human individual, but they could just as easily be taken other, uh, um, or excuse me, organized otherwise, taken on their own without a person in their midst. Does that make sense? Okay. This mutability is self-evident, not only in psychometrics, but also in data practices that we live with day to day. The digital systems that saturate and structure our lives quietly repeat this logic to us with every step we and our step counters take, joined as we are at the hip, though only loosely so. <laughs> I think this is part of a greater collapse under the weight of data, of the personal or human that can no longer be neatly isolated from the data-driven or non-human. Even the phrase, uh, oh, I'm missing a slide. Excuse me. Hold on. <laughs> That's not good. What happened? Let's try that again. 
even the phrase identity theft, <laughs> captures colloquial awareness that something as fundamental as identity is no longer a sure thing. Who we are has become a bad bet, a cluster of data points at risk of dispersal falling apart at the seams. Identity theft is adequately scary, but try flipping this logic. What if the identity persists and we're what's lost? So, here we go. In the data that turned the world upside down, Hannes Grossiger and Michael Kroger's Follow the story of Michael Kaczynski, a Polish psychologist now based at Stanford. In 2008, Kaczynski posted My Personality, a big five questionnaire in the form of a Facebook app in an attempt to collect some data for his grad school research. Innocent enough. He soon had millions of respondents who took the quiz and gamely agreed to donate their profiles for his research. He went on to use this gigantic data set to hone predictive models correlating personality quiz results with Facebook user data, achieving unprecedented levels of accuracy. So um, Grossiger and Kroger summarized his published research. He could use 68 Facebook likes to predict skin color, sexual orientation, and party affiliation. Quote, before long, he was able to evaluate a person better than the average work colleague merely on the basis of 10 Facebook likes. 70 likes were enough to outdo what a person's friends knew, 150 what their parents knew, 300 likes what their partner knew. More likes could even surpass what a person thought they knew about themselves. Close quote. <laughs> Eventually, he could use just number of profile pictures or contra uh, contacts or smartphone motion sensor data to ascribe big five values. So Kaczynski now suspects that Cambridge Analytica's strategies for influencing elections are, um, were based on his methods. The firm created their own quizzes to harvest Facebook data in combination with data acquired from commercial brokers. They drive tremendous on offline IRL political action by isolating and influencing uniquely identified individuals using predictive personality typing built on top of Kaczynski's predictive data tools, their method takes advantage of Facebook's massive user base, its permissive privacy policies, and micro-targeting. So micro-targeting in Facebook's advertising platform relies on so-called dark posts, newsfeed content items that are seen only by specified users remaining invisible to everyone else. In his New York Times article, Funk explains how micro-targeting of political messaging seeks, quote, to push the exact right buttons for the exact right people at the exact right times. For example, a pro-gun voter whose ocean score ranks him high on neuroticism could see storm clouds and a threat. The Democrat wants to take his guns away. A separate pro-gun voter deemed agreeable and introverted might see an ad emphasizing tradition and com community values, a father and son hunting together, close quote. In this way, psychometrics reveals a significant shift. Descriptive demographics are giving way to predictive psychometrics, probabilistically modeled on personality types. For example, according to Grossiger and Krogerus, Cambridge Analytica created 32 personalities focused on 17 states for the Trump campaign, using data models to isolate the groups predicted to be most actionable and to feed them hundreds of thousands of ad permutations in dark posts. The targeted groups included potential Trump voters and potential Clinton voters, like residents of Miami's Little Haiti neighborhood who saw dark posts about the Clinton Foundation's difficulties following the Haiti earthquake in an effort to persuade them to stay home from the polls in the key swing state of Florida. Um, in traditional political communication, we would call these kinds of dark posts doublespeak. In October 27, on October 27, mm -hmm. under pressure from critics and lawmakers, Facebook announced a new policy for political advertising intending to add transparency to political dark posts. In part, they plan to create a tool for users to see all of the ads an advertiser has sent to isolated user populations on the platform. While this policy revision is significant, it strikes me that the extraordinary algorithmic variability of these messages would make it impossible for any person to view every ad. Is it going too far to suggest that in their sheer number, or dare I say their capacity for speculative tuning, the totality of ads is not well suited for human consumption? What if not 
possibly impossible and likely unlikely, is the human feat of swallowing, never mind digesting, all of this datic potential. Perskell used Cambridge Analytica tools to inundate likely Trump supporters with Facebook ads tested in real time to be most effective out of, quote, 100,000 distinct pieces of creative content, close quote. And they ran between 40,000 and 50,000 variants of ads every day. Human or non-human, this over-the-top variability and customization in political content is a stunning repudiation of demographics which assumes commonality and which Nix, the CEO, dismisses as, quote, a really ridiculous idea, the idea that all women should receive the same message because of their gender or all African Americans because of their race, close quote. Now, let's pause because this is a fairly radical statement that one might expect to hear from a woke intersectional feminist, not the CEO of this company. And this makes me wonder uncomfortably if intersectionality itself might not be a little close to data mining. They both participate in a broader trend toward pursing the personal with infinite granularity. Consider recent social media mob attacks in the name of intersectionality, like those against painter Dana Schultz or philosopher Rebecca Tuval, which exemplify what I call intersectionality done badly, in that they make a particular arrangement of secondary qualities a precondition for communication without a perfectly and possibly impossible um, symmetrical data match solidarity is shut down times are strange right-wing white supremacists in khakis are rallying around identity politics <laughs> and leftist gatekeepers are silencing outside opinions by invoking intersectionality both result in greater isolationism, which I suspect is bred of defensiveness, perhaps an intuition that our own secondary qualities are abandoning us. As concerning as some of Cambridge Analytica's practices may be, this isolationism across the spectrum indicates to me that it is part of a larger pattern that is politically agnostic. My hunch is that the exhausting rise of networked data practices contributes to these vehement reassertions of an overbearingly autonomous, hence disconnected, self. Constant data transactions subtly reshape our self-conception as probabilistically computed, contingent, always available, and at risk. In exchange for tantalizing personalization, personhood is reduced to fragile data constellations requiring continuous maintenance to cohere. Predictive models do pinpoint people and do produce personalization. But now, the metrics themselves are becoming stand-in political subjects. This is key. Unmoored from the individuals they once de defined, personality types are gaining autonomous agency. The metrics attract politicians' deference, even though they can only be probable, probabilistically or <coughs> probably <laughs> correlated to any person. What's more, with ocean and micro-targeting, as Grossiger and Krogeris point out, it also works in reverse. Not only can psychological profiles be created from your data, but your data can also be used the other way around to search for specific profiles. This is a quote from them. So this reversibility is the independence of secondary qualities, attributes of objects with a logic of their own. They write, quote, essentially what Kaczynski had invented was sort of a people search engine. But notwithstanding real names and addresses, there is no actual person to be found who is conscientiousness. People are varying combinations of all five factors. Moreover, speaking for myself, my neuroticism or agreeableness fluctuates wildly based on things like proximity to lunch and <laughs> don't get me started on how variously I might answer the question, do I like art? People congregate in these waffling middles, while isolationist extremism is undeniably on the rise. So is it the sway of data pushing us like a centrifuge to the outer edges of this media ecosystem? This is exactly the type of polarization that Russian operatives at the Internet Research Agency, a Kremlin-linked St. Petersburg troll farm, sought to sow through dark post advertising as well as fake Facebook accounts 
moored in charismatically exaggerated false personalities. This is one of the images from these accounts. As Jonathan Albright of the Toe Center for Digital Journalism has shown, by posting viral content on so-called hot-button topics and relying on organic reach, the trolls perverted the intricacies of intersectional communities and funneled the trust of users who self-identified with content into even greater extremism, specifically because they calculated that it would lead to apathy and inaction. Put another way, both ocean personalities and trolls are non-human. They're in, of, and for data. Psychometrics can only indicate or find abstractions like openness and anticipations, meaning probabilistic future actions, presumed likelihoods, or possible trends in the data. So insofar as any person is ever more than a pattern in data, what psychometrics finds with Kaczynski's reverse lookup database is personalities without people, shells or placeholders for a self. And what is this abstraction of pure personality? Maybe a troll. Thank you. <laughs>